We are starting. It's cool. Awesome. All right. So, would you like to in introduce yourself? Um. Yeah. Sure. Um. My name's Nick. I'm a, a senior at Sage Creek High School. Um. Uh, I, like a violinist, I play in a lot of orchestras outside of school and in school. I'm the president of the Model of the United Nations, and I'm the co-published author of the American Exile and Arab American Foreign Policy. It's very cool, Nick. You got quite the background. Would you like to delve a little bit more into your book? Um, oh yeah, sure. So I started, so myself and Wiley um, met, first met in orchestra or model UN when he was a sophomore and I was a freshman, but we really didn't get off to a um, not a good start, I would say, but we didn't really talk much until I was in my sophomore year and he was in his junior year. And we really liked talking with each other about politics. We really liked joking with each other. But on the politics side of it, we decided that we want to have some sort of collaboration because we really have a cordial discussion about politics, especially with the Trump administration. So actually, first, uh, we wanted to do a podcast and him and I drafted up some ideas to discuss with the podcast, but the podcast didn't really have a certain theme. It was just uh, American foreign policy in the Middle East, French foreign policy, and it was just all over the place. It wasn't like a certain streamline or a certain theme. Um, but then, but then we realized that we were would be so busy with our extracurriculars and schoolwork that the podcast would never really work out, and no one. Re really listen to the podcast which is really um depressing to think about but so fast forward to the summer going into my junior year i come back from europe in the beginning of the summer and i text wiley i said well this is kind of a stretch but um hear me out would you like to write a book because think about it, it's a one-time thing it's really cool um to say that we're published authors and it would be really fun because we could um talk about political ideas with foreign policy and we could use our background with model UN um, to inform us on the book so what do you think and he said well I'd love the idea let's get right into it so like the July after I come back which I arrived from my vacation in June we really we immediately start the book and we really broke down our book into three different sections which aren't um, which aren't stated in the book but it's really um like u.s the, the u.s stands in um the third world so third world development and how we could really s uh, speed up the process for socioeconomic development in the third world we discuss the middle east which is iran and israel and then he talks and then wiley really talks about a variety of issues in his section he discusses like freedom of speech worldwide um, nuclear proliferation and I believe uh, one other chapter but it's not really a chapter we call an intermission because it's kind of the underlying concept in his chapters it's I believe global authoritarianism and how the U.S. could help prevent that and how we could take a stand as Americans to prevent that from happening worldwide and throughout the whole entire book him and I really get together and we find solutions that we could compromise on so yeah that's um the book in a nutshell. So we talked about, that's really cool. So we talked about our general contents of the book, the structure of the book. How, what would you say your favorite part of the book is? Um, well, it's, well, it's not just my, my favorite part is my native chapter. So the way the book works, as I said before, Wiley and I kind of divide and conquer. But with the solutions, um, we came down to a compromise because, because um, he has very different politics than I do. We're both on the left wing, but he's a huge Bernie Sanders progressive, and I'm more of a Andrew Yang, Biden moderate. So, of course, we have our differences with solutions. So we obviously came down to compromise with the solutions, and we used those. But 
one of the chapters that I wrote by myself was the NATO chapter and how the U.S. can reform NATO's goals and really expand the mind so it's more prevalent in global politics today. But ironically, Wiley said that all out of the whole entire book, the NATO chapter is his favorite as well. So, yeah, so that's my favorite and his favorite as well. Interesting. What would you say, um, like, maybe the hardest chapter... Or the, the section of the book that you struggled with the most? I would really ha- well, I wouldn't say I struggled with a chapter, but the chapter that was the hardest to write and um, the most in detail, I would really say is the Israel-Palestine chapter. Interestingly enough, before Wiley and I, because we actually worked on the Israel-Palestine chapter until at the very end. So him and I worked together. So he wrote the contest of the issue, and I wrote the solution for both the for the Middle East section, so Israel and Palestine and the Iran chapter. Um, but interestingly enough, at the in July of 2019, when we first started the book, we actually called, we cold called, we interviewed a professor at SDSU about Israel and Palestine. So we had all the solutions in like our solutions we would use for the Israel and Palestine chapter um, in order. So we really had to refine that. Wiley and I got together and I think that was the hardest to find a compromise with because the professor we interviewed was a brilliant guy, but he was he was a progressive and Wiley was very much in support of everything he was saying, but I wanted to tweak it a little bit so it was a little more moderate and what didn't come off as radical to some of the readers so that was the hardest um chapter for wiley and i i would say wow um my reactions are really bad (laughs) but it's it's still really it's a lot to take in it's really cool um what would you say would be a chapter that really reflects like how much you've grown as an author i mean um I can't really say for sure because obviously I wrote my first chapter, the, the very first chapter of the book, which is African Economic and Social Development, um, in August of 2019. So obviously I edited it, but I would say what's really indicative of how I grew as author was the first chapter because I wrote that chapter essentially when I was like going into 11th grade. I didn't because at that time I didn't, I didn't have so much political insight because after, like in mid-11th grade, I would say, I really started to listen to a lot of political podcasts. So I, my understanding of politics and the philosophy behind politics really um, was refined. So when I went back to the first chapter, um, not even editing it, I'm like, oh my god, this is horrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm like, how could I write such crap? So I would really say from, you can't obviously tell what the first chapter looks like because it's all edited, it's all refined, but I would really say personally for me as the author, from what I saw from my first draft to the first chapter to the final product, which is the published book, is really characterized my growth as an author and as a person who understands politics a little more. Cool. Uh, um. I'm trying to think. So if you could recommend, so if you could recommend the, uh, if you could recommend recommend the novel to anyone, what would be like the chapter you'd make them read the most, or you feel like the ones that's like most like influential in today's demographic? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's all it's all like it's all relevant. Yeah. How would you feel like the? Uh, well, freedom of speech and uh, preventing the rise of global authoritarianism which is the intermission it's literally called intermission <laughs> the rise of global authoritarianism that's like the halfway point Wiley wrote I would say um, either of those three chapters would be the most important particularly well what do you mean by uh, most influential like in global politics or just in domestic politics I would say domestically as well yeah okay so I'd probably say the rise of global authoritarianism or freedom of speech because you could tell 
with what's going on with the riots and protests that a lot of moves are being taken by the administration right now to um, to kind of disregard them and to kind of uh, push them off to the side because you see Trump sent in some of the troops to Portland to kind of take protesters off the street. So I think that's really dangerous if you think about that. Supposedly the leader of the free world is um, is infringing on the very principles that the U.S. is founded upon. And we really focus on how the U.S. should be, what the U.S. should do um, to protect freedom of speech worldwide. But now that you think about it, with all the developments that have happened since we published the book, like how can we protect the free world and freedom of speech worldwide if the U.S. cannot protect freedom of speech within its own borders? So those two chapters, I think, would resonate um, the most with Americans now. And the whole purpose of our book was to um, spark the, the discussion about international relations and um, America's role in the free world and in global politics. And obviously, you can't have a discussion about what the U.S. can't do abroad if the U.S. is not even doing the bare minimum to protect <laughs> our rights that precede government, as the founding fathers put it. Do you feel like this, in continuation, would be a threat to our democracy as a whole? Absolutely. You see, um, you see what Donald Trump is saying. You see what um, his administration is saying. That's all. Historically, with what you see with the rise of authoritarian regimes, is what Donald Trump is doing. You see him. Um, accusing the left wing of being so authoritarian and he tries to put his failures um, to um, find peace and to reform the law justly um, with the left wing and with the protesters which is exactly what you see historically with authoritarian um, <laughs> regimes you see um, in Poland like an excuse to excuse their extensive LGBT rights infringements. Like, in fact, I think there was an article published by the EU Parliament that out of all of Europe, out of the EU countries, Poland has the worst quality for protective LGBT rights, and you see the president right now who actually just won re-election by a small margin. I think he won by slightly less than 2%, and he says, oh, it's um, I think he compared the um, gay rights movement to communism or something. So, yeah. Yeah, so, rights. Yeah, and you see a failure among, um, and you and the way that happens is you see, like the way that happens is the failure of democracy. That um, when democracy in the face of struggle and democracy in the face of civil unrest, that authoritarianism comes to rise from that, and Wiley talks about that in his chapter with the intermission. So I think of all the chapters in the book that reflect what's going on in America, that people should read the, the intermission, because it, I think it's the shortest chapter out of the whole book, but people should really read that to show the symptoms of what causes the government to become authoritarian and to protect our rights at home first, and then once we secure those rights, secure... Um, our individual universal rights worldwide. Really, really good discussion right there. Um, moving forward, uh, how would you? So let's just say I'm I'm like I don't I don't have any experience in politics. How would you? What would you recommend that someone who really doesn't have any serious interest or like any background in foreign policy read? No, well, this would be a great book, Ben, because in the, when Wiley and I were first structuring the book, we wanted to find out whether it should be a book that's open to everyone or if it's a book open to higher academia. And we throw in some chapters that um, not most of the populace wouldn't understand, but we include issues like Israel and Palestine, African economic development, which the first couple issues that come to mind for Americans when you say foreign policy is just that. It's African economic development and it's 
Israel and Palestine in the Middle East. So the only prerequisite to open this book and start reading it is just to come in with an open mind, to come in without any um, preconceived thoughts about our book. So, yeah, we, we also structure each chapter so we don't go straight into the solutions because if you go straight into the solutions, what's insinuated with that is we already know you have an understanding, but that's not true for a lot of people. So we actually discuss the history of the issue in a very simplistic way, and we include sources, we include uh, published articles and published journals, so people get an understanding about what the context of the issue is. Then we go into the solution, so once people have the thought and are thinking about the context of each of the international issues, then they could really delve into the international solution to what the U.S. can do as a global leader. So, Nick, this is your this is your first book, correct? It is, yeah. Okay. It's Wiley's first book. Yeah, it is his first book. Are we going to see a second or a third? I would like to, I would like to uh, write my own um, second one. Wiley was thinking that maybe we should even do a global politics book in the first place. He said he wanted to do domestic politics. But I was very much against that because we deferred so much. It would just be a nightmare, more than a nightmare of writing um, this book. So I would like to write my own book about domestic politics at some point. And that brings me to another question. Um, how would you, So if, if you could republish the book, is there anything serious that you would change? Or do you feel like the product as a whole is perfect right now? I would, I would include um, two chapters. One chapter about um, the Uyghur camps in China, and the other one about Yemen, because because when Wiley, because originally we, I think we had those two chapters, not necessarily just the Uyghur crisis in Western China, but just protection of indigenous rights worldwide. I think Wiley started to write it, but he said, "Yeah, I can't do it. Like it's so broad." and it would just be a complete mess. It would be very hard to have a central idea that's very precise and really makes my ideas succinct. I agree with him. I said, yeah, um, I agree with you. Like, we should just nix it. And about the Yemen crisis, we were going to write it, but I said, well, in terms of the Middle East, I would much rather place our effort for the Middle East section in Israel-Palestine, which is a very hot bed issue, very controversial, not just in the Levant region in the Middle East, but worldwide, and I would like to place my effort into Iran as well, because that's the Alon Abbasid issue for the U.S. and its allies in the Middle East. And besides, no one really talks about Yemen anyway, so people would not really be acquainted with the idea at first. So I think we should just nix Yemen, and ironically, right after we published it in the beginning of July, you really see the... the social justice posts all over Instagram about what we could do for Yemen, what we could do for the Uyghur camps, and Wiley and I got so upset, like, we should have included those two chapters because that would have been, that would have aged very well for our book so people could read it and really um, discuss it and really get more of an idea, more complex idea about those two issues. So if I was to change anything with the book, I would not change the book, I would add those two chapters course so today is september 5th are there any relevant issues regarding foreign policy that you think would be like highlighted in the book or something that we can refer to in the book hmm. uh, well I, I would maybe say israel palestine of course that issue has kind of died down a little bit with the face of coronavirus um I actually started a newspaper with Jeremiah called the International Bobcat, where we write simplistic, non-biased articles about foreign policy. In the book, we're actually um, in a partnership with the Sage, where we give some of our articles for Sage Creek stands to write. And I wrote an article early on about what Israel and Palestine, what's happening in that region. And Israel released a new plan that they plan to completely annex the settlements inside um, Palestine, and of course that that's what's 
name. I think that it's Benjamin Netanyahu, who's a far right, the president of the far right, um, very conservative president of Israel. But his second, his co-president is more of a moderate right wing and says, well, we should focus on coronavirus before we should focus on that. So that's Israel Palestine is a smaller issue. I think a bigger issue is my chapter on extractive industries. So you see some major companies like Nike, Calvin Klein, um, that are using Uyghur labor um, to work in their factories. So we don't really touch on that a lot, but I would think the concepts behind that book and how the government should regulate uh, what companies do abroad and to report their tax returns and global payments is integral to what's going on with the Uyghur camps right now. Absolutely. Um... Nick, is there any other like things you'd really like like to really emphasize or tell us something we didn't go over? Um, no, not that I know of. There are some of the comments on Amazon. <laughs> oh, maybe we can actually pull some of those up. Yeah. And respond to them. Just gonna move my screen over a little bit. Oh, have you been? Um, you told me that you read a little bit of the book, but do you really like it so far? Have you done anything else with it? I it has been. A bit since I have read it, um, and I don't. Right now. I am within the first three pages. <laughs> I have no, not I been able to read too much of it, unfortunately. I do apologize. No, no, it's funny. Um, I have some family me family members that love it so far, but but they say that they couldn't get to it. Yeah, it's. Um, I will be getting to it within the next month for sure. Ah, there we go. Got my little tab opened up. Let's open. Perfect. Cool, we can start going through the interviews. Uh-oh. That could be an issue. <laughs> Nick, I lost your uh, I lost your screen. Or Oh that oh okay, that's okay. I wait. Oh there we go. Yay. Everything is good, everything is slightly wrong. Still getting used to some of the software. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Perfect. So, I guess we'll start going through some of the comments here. Yeah. Alright. From John DeMarco. Unfortunate propaganda infusion has produced a new version of oh, leftist... Oh, yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> Total acceptance of pro progressive dogma with zero depth research to at least consider alternative descriptions of the events and policy issues. The obviously unworldly and typically youthful young men with minds full of mush, painful to get through the first 30 pages, since every justification for predictable conclusions that Trump and Republican are evil and Obama administration is beautified and endorsed by Jesus himself. Pure dri <laughs> drivel, drivel, but got... Got to give some credit to the authors for achieving enough attention and admiration through the same-minded peers to become certified for publication and bright future in the party. Do you have any responses to that? Oh, yeah, I do. Um, I, just a quick note. You know what dribble means? It means I nonsense. Do not. So not, oh, my goodness. A, yeah, that is a very, not a bad word, but it's... Um, Different. Yeah, it's, I've never heard that word before. I'll be honest, I had to Google it. <laughs> Okay, so I have a few words to say. So, a little backstory. So, my grandma um, is a historic Republican, but I think she's voting for Biden this election because she just hates Trump so much. And she loved my book, and I really kind of um, show what Trump has done that isn't great for foreign relations. Um, and she has some friends back east, and they're huge Republicans. 
and she was very, my grandma was very happy that I wrote the book and was trying to spread the word on the book, and she told her friend, not John DeMarco, but it's his wife, and my grandma said, oh, Nick just wrote a book, it's amazing, and they said, oh, is it anti-Trump? She said, yeah, it's pretty anti-Trump. She said, but just read it, let me know. She said, it's more of the fact that he published the book at 17 years old, more than anything else. And my grandma came back to me and said, um, and said that, well, don't expect, don't have high expectations because they are huge Trump supporters. John DeMarco listened to Fox News 24/7 and Rush Limbaugh 24/7. I'm like, oh yeah. Oh dear. After you told me, like, after you telling me that, like, I don't have high expectations, but whatever. I'm a free speech guy. I think there there are no bounds of free speech. So um, let them have it. So I haven't heard anything for a while, and after I come out of stage with my textbooks, my schedule, I get in my car, and Wiley texts me. He's like, oh, Nick, we have our first one-star review with a bunch of laughing emojis. And I read through it, and I'm like, who the hell is John DeMarco? <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that at first, and Wiley texts me back, he's like, oh, it's some random guy from New Jersey. And it all started to come to me, like, oh my god, this is... My grandma's family friend. Oh my goodness! He sent that, so he knew that it was my grandma's grandson, and he still wrote that. And I was both shocked, but it was really funny at the same time because you could tell it's like his Rush Limbaugh, um, his Rush Limbaugh a feather coming out in that comment. <laughs> Interesting. But I have some words for it. I don't want to sound. Um, too offensive, but I think people like John DeMarco are the very problem of what's happening with America. That both sides, I'm not blaming just the Republican Party, but the Democratic Party as well, you see such a division, which I call the bunkering effect, where people don't come out of the bunker to have a civil discussion and to have an exchange of ideas, but rather they just bunker further into the ground and there is just a lack of intelligence discourse that is the very foundation of our democracy so it's such a shame that just political discourse has evolved into political rants and insults to each other rather than discussing the very concepts of politics themselves so and just to break apart his comment that he said that we hate Trump which is uh, pretty true but he said that we say the Republican Party is evil, despite the fact that in the first chapter, we, like for the Africa chapter I wrote, I support a Bush-era policy in the book. And what's more ironic about his comment is that he says, oh, it's progressive dogma, it's propaganda, even though he's the one that consumes propaganda 24-7, with Rush Limbaugh, nonetheless, and Fox News. Very... Very cool comment. <laughs> um, so we have another review from an Amazon customer. Three stars. Meh. Oh, yeah. Meh from EJ. Yeah, EJ didn't even read the book. He, <sighs> he knew I wrote the book, but I think he did that just to get on my nerves. So he wrote <laughs> meh. And if you see, I think in that comment he says P.S. John DeMarco, whatever his name is, dumb. is dumb. Yeah, and two people found it helpful, didn't they? We also have another review from one of Ron Lewis Cordell's best students. I know who that is. I'm not going to say that in case someone uh, watches that, but they didn't read the book, but I think they just found out. They have the book now. They purchased it, and they said they'll let me know what they think of it. But, yeah, the person that wrote that comment didn't read the book. I think they just did that to inflate the ratings. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a review from Jeremiah that says five stars in-depth and engaging it really shows off the author's character and a view of what america's international character could be do you have any yeah, responses it was an amazing friend throughout the whole process um in the beginning of the pandemic him and i would meet to work on ap psychology in one night he says well i don't have anything to work on shy again i'm like well i'm like i have a quick favor for you i said i'm writing the nato chapter right now and if you would like to read through it as to give me some tips because I just want to get an idea of what people think about the book and everything. He said, yeah, sure. And he was reading through it and he 
gave some really good edits. He said, I love re- writing. I love reading through it. I love editing it. And I said, well, I have a big job for you. I said, would you like to help Wiley and I edit the book? And he said, oh, absolutely. I would love to. So he helped edit the whole book. And the edits were awesome. I loved everything he's done to help Wiley and I. Like, he really sped up the process way more. And he really made our ideas way more to same dance effective so thank you jeremiah if you ever listen to this i wiley and i thank you awesome big props to jerry for his help yeah i awesome. actually left him we have acknowledgments at the back of the book um if you want me to read some of them i can that'd be awesome okay where is it here they are okay so I, I thank Jeremiah for, um, for giving the book the quality it deserves and playing countless hours with us and editing the book. I thank Jonathan Grobart, the professor we interviewed at SCSU. He, he's an amazing guy. He's very insightful and definitely inspired me to look more into the, the topic of Israel and Palestine. I also thank Mrs. Alberts for leading the Genius Project and set, starting a platform for which Wiley and I used to write our book. And I thank Mr. Pearson, uh, the greatest history teacher ever, and he's also the advisor for Model the UN. And we thank our family, and, we th- and Wiley thank you a special shout out to his friend, Eric Plotkin. I don't know if you know who he is. Mm-hmm. I, know, I know Eric. <laughs> you do? Okay. So now just that just know him, vaguely, uh, though. Yeah, when we would always walk past each other at school, and up until it, uh, up until we school closed, Wiley and I got some work done, but not nearly as much as we did during quarantine. And Eric would always her- harangue me, saying, "Hey, Nick, have you been working on the book?" <laughs> I'm like I'm trying to get onto it right now, Eric. And he would always do that until school closed. Oh my goodness. No, it's really funny. Wiley <laughs> said, well, he's my best friend. And um, obviously he um, gave us some um, patronage to write the book. So do you mind if I leave a note and I'm like, yeah. Of course. Ahead. Yeah, I don't have anything else okay. to say unless you have some other questions. I think we're all set on questions. We're about at the 35 minute mark. Nick, thank you so much for the opportunity for this interview. Oh, no problem. And I hope this interview reaches your followers and support well. It has been truly awesome. Sounds good. Cool. I will send it to the Sage, and I think I don't know what else I'm going to do with it. I don't know if I'll post it or something, but yeah, we'll cool. see what happens. Awesome. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much.